Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by the amazing Bentley Mitchum. Bentley, how are you doing today, man? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me here today. Oh, no, this is amazing for me. He actually just transferred up from Milford so he could have this <laughs> conversation with us. Um, for, you guys, you may recognize Bentley from such films as Demonic Toys, Ruby in Paradise, The Man on the Moon, and countless others. But I would be remiss if I didn't talk about a movie that has meant so much to me. It's affected me to my core. You guys have all heard me talk about it a thousand times. North, sometimes they come back. The criminally underrated, sometimes they come back. I got to ask you this. Now, I know when you guys were filming this, it was a made-for-TV film. Did you ever think that it would have the following that it still has today? Yes and no. I mean... I was really excited when I got cast in the Stephen, Sp uh, Stephen King movie, obviously. I mean, that's that's an honor in itself. He's the king of horror. And even, even bad Stephen King movies have their own cult following just because it's Stephen King. So I knew that it would have some kind of a following, and I was happy about that. But I did not expect it to have, I think, what, two or two sequels after it? I think it's had... Didn't expect that. I didn't expect to be here, what, 20, 30 years later talking to you about it. You know, that's really cool. It's really cool. And it is, man, because like I said, something we talked about a little bit is it's a great ghost story, but it has everything to it. I mean, this movie will give you chills. Um, it does have a little bit of a comedic side, like oh, we got to be bored if we're doing the face. You know, right. like it, it does have all these things to it. And it one scene that I would like to talk about with you real quick before we actually get into the reason why we're here. Something I've always loved about this film is you really feel at the beginning of this movie that the bullies were not trying to go as far as they were. And something that's always affected me, even at a young age, when um, Wayne gets stabbed and North is laughing and that laugh <laughs> just goes away and the look on your face almost just goes to ice like after what you just watched. And then you look and you see the other guys just looking at each other like, oh, my God, did this really just happen? No, we just, you know, it, it, yes, in that moment, you know, as a, as a teenager, you feel that we took things too far. It's a <laughs> we just really messed up. Where do we go from here? And your performance in that scene alone, because you have that cackle, man, like you got that laugh. And then just the way that you, ha, 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 like in your face gets ice. Like how yeah. long did it take you guys to film that scene? Well, you know, we did that. We filmed in Kansas City and it was a night shoot and it was freezing cold and it was a long night. And uh, we actually filmed in a tunnel, that, but that wasn't a, I think it was an old train track tunnel. There was no, there were no train tracks in that tunnel. And the production had to lay the train tracks down in that tunnel to, to double as a real train track um, yeah. railway. <clears throat> and uh, it's funny you mentioned that laugh because I remember when we were filming that, I felt that um, Robert Russler's character was pretty much our leader and very distinctive. And I remember Nick Sadler's character and the way he looked and his creepiness was just so spot on. He was a, a like a New York actor, you know. He he had that kind of like almost theater training and doing the stretching out before he acts kind of thing. Very serious yeah. actor. And then there was my character, and I was like, well, what what sets my character apart from these guys? Because if I don't have something that's unique to me, I'm just going to get lost in the whole shuffle of it all. You know, I'll be like the third wheel of the gang kind of thing, and. Uh, and I don't know how it happened, but one of the scenes happened and I, 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 that laugh came out of me and I was like, oh, that's it. That's kind of like the signature yeah. of this guy. He's like the cackling weirdo, right? And so um, when we did that particular scene, I don't think it, it took longer than any other scenes. I think we all kind of realized what was going on in that scene. And the, the moment of transition, I think was important for all of us to be on the same page of because yeah. you know when you're playing a bad guy in a movie you don't want to play a bad guy you want to play a guy that's justifying everything you're doing and we right. were just out to have some fun and mess with these kids 
you know, scare them, maybe take their shoes and mess with them or take their money or their books and call them sissies because we're bored. We're not sitting there thinking, how can we be evil tonight? You know, so I think that all of us as, as the actors and just as a group, we're kind of on the same page with that, that, you know, that was the moment when we realized that our, our messing around went too far. And it was really cool when we filmed this movie because, uh, as I said, we were in Kansas, so it was a location shoot for us. Um, we were L.A.-based actors. And uh, Robert, Nick, and I, when we met, we all just started hanging out as a group. Yeah. And we were doing everything together. And we were also kind of kind of jerks to a lot of the, the other cast members and stuff because we were we were staying a little bit in character even when we weren't on on set. And I remember the girl, and I can't remember her character's name, but it's the girl we hang in the barn. Yeah. And she had flown in only for I think a couple days work. She wasn't on set for that long because I think she had a couple classroom scenes. Runs into uh, Jimmy Norman downtown and then ends up dead. So she didn't have a long time on the shoot. And um, I remember that like two in the morning, the three of us running down the hall to her hotel room and like banging on her door and, and just harassing her. And it really, it was kind of mean in retrospect, but in our minds at the time, we were just trying to stay in character to make it easier for her to fear us in a way, mm -hmm. you know? So um the camaraderie and the bond between the three of us in that film actually was taking place off screen as well. Uh, and so I think that there was a certain synchronization, syn synchronicity, I should say, of when we film scenes like that, where you see all of our looks kind of shift and change at the same time where it might not have been talked about, but it just kind of sort of organically happens. So um, I guess that's a long answer for it didn't really take much more time than the normal, a normal scene would take but I think a lot of the work that went into making it flow smoothly in that aspect was the fact that we did these kind of things as a group in camaraderie and we're in sync with each other as actors on and off screen. Well, and that makes sense now because she looks at him with pure hatred in the classroom. So maybe there was a little bit of that was a little genuine. She was probably <laughs> she was pissed off that. the night before that we were waking up because I'm sure as an actress, she's taking it very seriously and trying to get a good night's sleep and gone mm -hmm. over her dialogue and prepared and wants to be showing up on time and here these jackasses are coming and banging on her door. So <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure she wasn't that happy about it, but uh, hopefully it made for her uh, her performance a little easier, you know? Right. And I love that method acting, you know, there, there's a certain type of person it takes to be a method actor, to be able to stay in that character all the time. And that's when you know this is yours. You know, you don't have to go in between scenes and go, can I get a line read? Can I get a read? No, right. it's me. I don't have to do a read. I know it's me. I don't have to watch you do it. I'm doing it. And I, I, I wouldn't say it was like a thing. full, I wouldn't say it was a full staying in method character, like a Dustin Hopp in a marathon man or something like that, you know? <laughs> But we definitely, um, we were definitely like rebellious rabble rousers off off camera. But I wasn't doing that laugh, and you know I wasn't like being north one hundred percent of the time. Right. You know, Nick wasn't well, and, there picking his nails all the time. Right. <laughs> well, yeah, th throwing apples at people. Right. Um, so I do want to say, if you guys haven't seen this film, sometimes they come back. I, one, I can't recommend it enough. And I recommend you pick up a DVD or a Blu-ray where you can get a couple special features. If not, I have a link for it down here in the description. It is streaming on YouTube right now. But physical media, if you know me, you know that's the way to go. And I can't recommend this movie enough. But you can check it out down here in the description. And while you're down there, I have all of Bentley's social media links down here in the description as well. So make sure you're following him to stay up to date on everything that he's doing too. Um, now, sometimes they come back as a movie that affected me. It really did. This is a movie that um, I talk about it to this day. There's a scene in the film where older Jimmy Norman is watching uh, TV and it cuts to a home video of him and Wayne playing ball in the yard. And then Wayne's face drops. He does the run, Jimmy, run. And like that scene is something that's always stuck with me because it felt real to me. I grew up in a video store and watching videos is something that was just second nature to me. So watching this video come to life, 
is something that terrified me. So I want to go back to the past for you now, Bentley, and I want to talk about what got horror started for you, uh, the first horror movie that you watched. And this is going to be a little bit of a tricky answer here, but your first experience with horror was? Well, <clears throat> you said it's a tricky answer because you know you know <laughs> a little bit of my, my answer here. Uh, when I was really young, my mother went to a drive-in and I was in the back seat supposed to be asleep. And she went to see A Clockwork Orange. And I don't think that that would maybe fit the definition of a horror film. But from the age I was peeking through the seats, laying down, peeking through the two front seats, yeah. and seeing some of these images of the droogs and the, the, the rape scene that goes on. I should not have seen this stuff as a child. My mom wasn't a bad mom. She thought I was sleeping. She, I don't think she still knows when I saw that. But that was, it was a terrifying thing to see as a child. And, you know, those images um, stayed with me. And it's, you know, the first time you see a horror film that affects you, it'll stay with you because it, it makes you confront emotions inside of you that you might never have felt before. And I think that's one of the, the weird beauties of horror films is we're allowed to confront unknowns and fears and emotions in us in a safe environment vicariously on the screen. And some people get so into it that, you know, you'll go to the theater and you'll see them standing up yelling at the screen, turn around, what's the matter with you? You know, And sometimes like, like with me, you know, there'll be movies that I'm watching and especially when I was younger, you know, in my early teens that I, I, I suddenly realized my feet were coming up off the floor and onto the seat because I was just getting creeped out, you know, yeah. and, uh, but it's a safe environment, but you're still allowed to be terrified. I think that, um, so I think that's my first one that really uh, affected me. And there's another one that I saw when I was really young. It was uh, back in the in the day, they, Aaron Spelling used to have movies of the week, which they don't have anymore on television. And, you know, Fridays or Saturday nights, it'd be like the ABC movie of the week. And there'd be movies that were actually made for television. And sometimes they would have like a movie that used to be in the theater that they'd show on television. That was an extra special event back then. We didn't have Netflix and things like that, you know. <laughs> um, and Aaron Spelling did this movie called Crowhaven Farm. And if you haven't seen it, it's very creepy. And it's actually one of my favorite um, genres of horror, where it's almost like reality-based creepy. And... It's, you know, th these people move into a town and they're, they're new in the town and it's a remote town and everything seems normal at first kind of thing. And as the story unfolds, you realize the whole town is involved in, in ritual and they've kind of stumbled into this horrific situation where they end up, I don't know if I want to do a spoiler in it in case you do end up seeing it, but they end up burying them alive, the whole town. And, you know, of course, after they're being chased around and stuff, and they've dug these shallow graves that are maybe two, three feet deep, and they put them in these graves, and they take these doors, just like a normal door that you'd have on a, you know, a bathroom or a bedroom or whatever, and they put it over them, and they start piling rocks onto it. Oh. And that image from, a, from my childhood was just terrifying. I'd never seen, like, someone being buried alive and crushed by these rocks, and it was really something that affected me and as I grew older I couldn't find the name of it for the longest time and I would ask people have you seen this have you seen this? and I think one day I was on a set and we were talking horror films and I asked someone like do you know this movie that was on TV They're like yeah that was an Aaron Spelling movie Crowhaven Farm I was like oh thank you thank you right <laughs> um and then I would think the movie that stayed with me the most in horror films throughout my life was Jaws and that was in the 70s. And that was like the first Hollywood block summer blockbuster. And uh, that movie, The Monster, was so scary because it was real. It, right. It, you know, it could be real, at least. And that affected me. Even if I go swimming in a lake, that I, I think of that movie. And I think of what's below me. And I've seen these these move this movie and I've seen what that shark's doing and I don't know what's below me and it it it's still affected I I wanted to try surfing I wanted to try surfing moving to California 
And I went out on the board and it took me forever to get out there. And so I'm out there exhausted, waiting for the next swell to come in and my feet are hanging over the edge. And all I'm thinking is the shark's view, looking up at the surfboard with my legs. And so my legs are coming up onto the board. And then I finally try to I catch the wave and I wipe out. And I'm like, I'm not gonna spend that much energy to go out there again, to sit there terrified <laughs> for five right. minutes waiting for a wave to wipe me out again. I don't like this sport. And it's all because of that movie. It's all because of that movie. So that movie has affected me to this day, going swimming in the ocean, lakes even. Mm -hmm. That's a horror movie. Well, Jaws is such an iconic horror movie that people that have never seen Jaws know the theme song. You know, anytime yeah. that you're swimming with friends, you always have the do do. You know, like that's yeah. how important this movie is. And um, I mean, they have the balls to kill a kid in the movie, man. Like you have the Alex Kittner death and you, know, you see him out there flailing around the blood and the people on the beach getting up and getting all worried. Like, um, do you remember which scene it was from Jaws that just really, really affected you the most? Well, the first jump scare when the head rolls through yeah, into the view of the hole in the boat, that one definitely was a jump scare that got me. <clears throat> I think the opening scene, you know, it starts out kids having fun and it's like the girl takes off her clothes and it's kind of sexy and you're like, ooh, where's this movie going, you know? And suddenly she's out in the, the water and it's like beautifully lit and she's like, hey, and all of a sudden you see her go boom, under like the yeah. shock come on her face. And like the whole movie takes a left turn right there. And it's like, what am I into? What? And then, and you know, there's little, little stupid things that like when Roy Scheider stands up looking out and the camera like pulls in on him as he's standing up and looking out, it's like, I remember that, you know, I remember like the look on his face as we're zooming in on him. It's like we're zooming in on his his horror, his fear. And it, it wasn't even looking. It wasn't even the shark. I mean, the shark, in retrospect, you look back and you can see it's a, a, a mechanical shark. And in certain areas today, they do it with CGI. I actually prefer animatronics and things like I like the first Jurassic Park as opposed to the new ones. I like that. Um there's a charm to it, but back in the day, we hadn't seen anything like that. We didn't right. have CGI to compare it to. And it was, you know, you, you, it, the movies back then, we were so much more willing to suspend our, our disbelief that we're going into a movie and like, show me, entertain me, I'm in your world, let's go. And when they right. showed that shark and that shark came up and we're gonna need a bigger boat. I also love that, um, that scene when they're on the boat and they're singing here uh, we want to go home tired and i want to go to bed and in the background you see the barrel just go underwater out the window like that <laughs> the little subtle things man it was so good so good <clears throat> well and you just talked about you know you're going to need a bigger boat you're going to need a bigger boat i think that's probably one of the most quoted lines in all of horror um and then you also have fire you son of a that's another one that really really i loved that as a kid now, even as a kid you feel that feeling of victory like yes he got it Find <laughs> yeah. everything they've gone through so um a question i've been asking lately bentley and this is one that's a little tricky especially with jaws i feel like um remakes requels sequels that's kind of the thing right now um, is Jaws a movie that you would like to see remade today? Probably not. You know, it was such an impactful movie in my life that I liked. I don't want to revisit it in 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 a new way. Um, and I knew I know that they would probably try to update it and um, fill it all with CGI and probably make it ten times more gory and probably have more boobs and stuff in it or something. It would it would probably ruin the original experience I had. If they remade it, I probably wouldn't see it, mm -hmm. you know? That's fair. I, I, I think I'm with you. There's certain movies, I think, that, I mean, you even look at, I mean, let's be honest right now, Jaws is a franchise, and 2, 3, and 4 don't even hold a candle to what Jaws was. That's how special it was. I agree with you, and even all the tragedy that happened on set with Bruce the shark of not being able to work. I think that really added the suspense to the film that you're not seeing the shark. You're seeing what the shark is doing, but you never have that view of the shark. I mean, 
think about they ripped that whole dock off, you know, and the yeah. shark takes the dock with it, you know, because they can't show the shark because it keeps messing up. So they're coming up with all these other ways to show you what the shark is capable of. And I think that enhances the suspense of the film. Well, one of the brilliant things about that movie <clears throat> is I sincerely believe in order for a horror movie to work, you need to see the face of evil. Whether it's, you know, uh, Pinhead or Jason or Michael Myers, we know what the evil looks like, okay? In Jaws, because of the monster, what the monster is, we know what the evil looks like without having to see it. So they were able to show us pieces of it and flashes of it and let our imagination create the monster as much as the monster was created on the screen. So that's the brilliant thing. You know, they try to do some horror movies where they don't show you the monster and they just don't work as well. Oh. You know, it's like you're seeing it from the monster's point of view the whole time or the serial killer's point of view, and you never see the face of evil. Not only is it a dumb move, in my opinion, it's only my opinion, not the smartest move to do as a producer because now you can't market the mask on Halloween, <laughs> right? Right. But it also doesn't have the same effect on, on you being able to put a face on evil. So right. that and that's really the thing about it. I mean, you can't kill the boogeyman. You know, everybody, when you think of these movies, that's the first thing you think of, whether it's um, the theme, is it Halloween, Jaws, Psycho. You think of the music of those movies, even if you've never seen them. But when it comes to a visual, you're right. When it's uh, Hellraiser, it's Pinhead. Friday the 13th, it's Jason. Nightmare, it's Freddy. That's the first image that pops into your brain. So we know about the first experience you had with horror. But now I want to throw you a little bit of a curveball here, brother. My little buddy Ghostface has a question for you. What's your favorite scary movie, Bentley? What is your favorite horror movie of all time? We know your first, but now I got to know your favorite. I think I would have to say, and it's probably a disappointing answer, but I would, I think I would probably say, you know, there's different types of horror movies and each mm -hmm. one affects me differently. But the ones that are popping into my mind right now is The Shining. I think the symbolism that they used and the way that Kubrick shot it and the way he set the, the uh, you know, when he had the set where you, the guy would, take three left turns and by all intents and purposes he should be outside but we're filming and he's still in the hallway like subtle things that weren't adding up in the subconscious mind that that movie really played tricks on your subconscious and that movie that scene when the lady in the bathtub when i saw that when i was young creeped me out i could not go into the bathroom if the curtains were closed because i was afraid that she was on the other side yes, of the man. every time so that would definitely be one of my one of my favorites. I think Jaws is one of my favorites, even though it was one of my first. And I have to say the very first Halloween, because I saw it when it came out in the theaters. Mm -hmm. And we hadn't seen a movie really like that, especially in the theaters. And that mask that they used for Michael Myers was so creepy and expressionless. And the fact that he had no expression and was so horrifying was horrible. Mm -hmm. it, it it made your heart race just seeing him standing there, you know, behind the sheets, whatever it was, that yeah. expressionless face. It, it was, uh, I think that was the start of a whole amazing genre of slasher films and serial killer films mm -hmm. that uh, it's iconic, you know, and I think, I think I go back to the originals, you know, I, I love, I love the uh, original Universal Monsters movies. You know, it's like, yeah, they, they don't, they hold up in their own way with their charm. They don't hold up to what we expect in a horror movie today, but there's a charm to these movies and they're cool. They're cool movies. Um, yeah. So I, I, I guess I don't know what my favorite horror movie is. There's so many different kinds. That, you know what? I love that answer because I never tell anybody that I'm going to ask them that question because that's what I want. I want a genuine answer. And I feel like if I tell people they're going to research, they're going to think. But when I ask you on the seat of your pants and you can give me, you know, I like this one for this. I, I mean, The Shining, I have that back here, room 217, back behind me all the time. That's what that movie means to me. You know, like no matter what my set design may be for the episode, some things are always here. And that's one of them. And Universal Monsters. You pulled your own, you, you pulled your own Stanley Kubrick there. 
Yeah, man. <laughs> all, all the time. <laughs> but, and you, you talked about Universal Monsters. I think that Creature from the Black Lagoon is another one that I think is a very underrated horror movie in the history of the world. Like, it's just a great, sad story. And it doesn't get the credit it deserves because it's overshadowed by The Mummy, Dracula, Frankenstein, Bride of Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, all these things that are also amazing in their own right. But I think it brings down what the creature was. So, um, Bentley, I've had an amazing time hanging out with you and learning how horror started for you, my friend. But before I let you go, I want to go back to Jaws. And I want to ask you one last question. What we're going to do is we're going to rank Jaws on a skull count. Now, we are not going to rank it on production, score, acting, direction, nothing like that. What we're doing, not being critics, we're judging Jaws on how much it affected you on first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective, five being extremely effective. You can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. What would your ranking of Jaws be? On original viewing, given the time frame, a 10. Yeah. God, it's, it's <laughs> Five plus it's plus, plus man. Not, man. Without a doubt. That movie, like I said, I saw that movie in the 70s and it's 2022 and it's still with me. Mm -hmm. No other movie's done that. Dude, like you said, we go on a lake and we're like, what's down at my feet? And that's that's because of movies like Jaws that do that to us. So it's not um, even movies like Jaws. Is the third act. Oh, go ahead. It's not, it's not even movies like Jaws. It is Jaws that did that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could watch Anaconda all day long and go swimming in a river, but I'm still thinking about Jaws in the river. Right. <laughs> and that that first one that always sticks and it's funny because i don't in any way condone drug use i think anybody that knows me does know that but watching a horror movie for the first time it, it's like doing drugs like you get that high and then you're constantly chasing that again and that's what i love about horror you know you'll get that fear in another movie and you feel it again like oh my gosh there it is that's what i was looking for it's like roller coasters you know like that adrenaline and i love that about horror and you've been in one of those movies that i continue i've watched I watched this movie a couple weeks ago. I mean, Me Ryan Knight, good friend of mine, man. And um, it's a movie he contacted me. He's like, dude, I want to do an episode about this. You're the first person I thought of. And it meant the world to me because this movie changed my life. Between this, House 1986, and Nightmare on Elm Street. Those are the three horror movies that dude. I wouldn't be me without those movies. Nightmare on Elm Street was another, another level horror for that time they took the serial killer and put it on acid you know it was like yeah, suddenly the killer's arms were stretching out and and the whole dimension if you can't that was a movie that i saw in the 80s and uh it creeped me out i hadn't felt that way in a while mm -hmm. so i agree with you on that one for sure i had not felt that way in a while I've, i was like 18 19 when i saw that and that gave me the heebie-jeebies and you know afraid to put my feet on the floor from what's under the bed you know i hadn't felt that in a long time so I, i'm with you on that for sure the first one yeah first viewing of the, the first one the, the first one just changed like you said it flipped horror on its head what's the worst thing about a killer if you can't escape him and you have to sleep no matter what so i love that and man if I could do this again in 27 years and bring you back up from Milford again, I promise you I would, man. This has been so much fun. Um, we are at the end of the third act, guys. The credits are about to roll and the curtain's about to drop. But before it does, there's some links down here that need some clicking. So if you haven't seen it, sometimes they come back. Please check it out down here below. And make sure you're following Bentley on social media so you can stay up to date on everything he's doing. Um, don't go anywhere, brother. I got a couple more questions for you. Uh, everybody else, as always, keep talking horror. Stay what you are. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank you.